Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, scientists, artists, educators, social scientists, government leaders, politicians, all will be one to one. I'm delighted to welcome the new president of the New York State Bar Association, Bernice Lieber, to the program. She's already made an impact on the organization in the short time she's been in office. She's formed a blue ribbon task force to study the proliferation of wrongful convictions. Welcome. Thank you, Cheryl. It's great to be here. Bernice, you have been a trial lawyer for almost 30 years, and you have focused, I gather, on intellectual property, securities, and complex financial and business disputes. Why did you decide to pursue the presidency of the State Bar Association? Well, you know, I've always believed, and it's sort of been inculcated into me, that we have to give back to our communities. Uh, and even as a young associate, uh, I worked at a firm that really engendered those kinds of values. And one of the best ways, I thought, to make an impact on our society and help people uh, is to work through a bar association because it gives you a totally different perspective of being able to be objective and do the right thing. And that's really why I got involved in bar association activities way back before I even was a partner in mm -hmm. a law firm. Now, the State Bar Association has 74,000 members. What percentage of that is that of all the licensed attorneys in the state? Currently, there's about 150,000 licensed attorneys in New York. Uh, the State Bar is the largest nationwide voluntary bar association, and we represent approximately 74,000, uh, which is about 38 percent of all lawyers in New York. Right. Now, we've discussed the fact that we, both of us went to the same law school. <laughs> That's right. Um, and I have actually served on a committee of the Association of the Bar of the New York City, and I'm familiar with the New York City, the New York County Lawyers Association, and I know that. Um, at least the local bars tend to have committees addressing a variety of legal issues, and they sponsor panels and conferences on a variety of legal issues. But I know almost nothing about the State Bar Association. So tell me what you do. I mean, are you primarily a lobbying organization for lawyers, an educational organization? What kinds of things do you do? We like to think of ourselves as the voice of the New York lawyer. Uh, we are in every of the 62 counties around the state. We have representatives who serve in the policymaking body called the House of Delegates, in which each county sends representatives to sit in the House of Delegates in order to deliberate on policy issues that affect lawyers, the profession, and our state citizens. Uh, and uh, in addition, uh, there is a group of sections and committees. There are 24 sections and committees. Most recently, the newest addition is our, uh, our alternate dispute resolution section uh, that address varying issues in different subject areas of the law, environmental, uh, commercial litigation, uh, business dispute, business section. Um, and in addition, the president each year has, uh, has the right to establish certain committees that look into more specific problems affecting the law and society. And so to that end, presidents have appointed special committees and task forces to do that. But beyond that, we have uh, something like 80 committees that address different subject areas, in equal rights, mm -hmm. for instance, civil rights, for right. instance. And together, we try and harness this great association of 74,000 lawyers um, to do uh, a variety of things. One is uh, to keep up with our continuing legal education requirements, but um, more formidably, to write about the law, to develop initiatives that are, have impact statewide and federally. And for instance, some of our sections, like the tax section, is renowned nationwide for producing the highest quality tax um, views for Congress and for the state. So uh, it's a great organization and one that I uh, really feel privileged to be leading. In my capacity as president of the State Bar, I chair something called the Executive Committee, which is a smaller amalgam of folks who are uh, representing each of the judicial districts around the state. And uh, they deal with the day-to-day -day activities of the State Bar in between the four House meetings we have uh, during the year.
Now, I, I said earlier that you have established this Blue Ribbon Committee on looking into the problem of wrongful convictions. Um, obviously, a wrongful conviction is certainly a personal tragedy when it happens to you, but to what extent is this a problem? To what extent is this a uh, systemic problem? Nationwide, there have been over 200 wrongful convictions that have been overturned on the basis of DNA evidence testing alone. Uh, this has become a national epidemic uh, for us when people who are going through the judicial process uh, wonder whether there's a fair administration of justice all along the way. Uh, for instance, in the state of Virginia, uh, our research, preliminary research, shows there's been a hundred wrongful convictions that have been overturned just in the last few years years. Uh, to me, this represents a historic opportunity for our state bar to look at our cases and determine of all these many cases that have been reported and decided and where innocent people have been sent to prison, um, why did this happen to them? Where along the way did the system let us down? Uh, because uh, fundamentally, the fair administration of justice is the firmest pillar in our society. And I truly believe that by having a task force which can address these cases, we may get to the bottom of where the process should be reformed. And whether that's from the point of view of um, the, where someone is interrogated as a witness by the police to uh, false confessions, the whole question of false confessions, uh, the question of uh, how people are identified in lineups, right through the process of indictment and trial, uh, and the preservation of evidence, po proper preservation of evidence, are the kinds of issues that a state bar such as ours have always been addressing. Uh, and I'm hoping, hoping that this wonderful blue, pa blue ribbon panel um, will be able to pinpoint and address where we should be able to fix the system. Right. And I mean, this is not an issue in New York because there's not a death penalty currently, but you know, you know some of these wrongful convictions, these overturning of convictions have been, you know, people have been on death row for 16 years, 20 years, which is very frightening. Yes, the frightening statistic is that the average time, just on the basis of the cases we have so far, shows it takes 11 and a half years to release someone who's been wrongfully convicted uh, of a crime that they never committed. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think of the societal costs, that is, it's just not the, the horror of someone spending that amount of time in prison when he or she should never have been there, but it's also the cost of maintaining that person in prison, the cost of compensating that person for all the wrong and harms that were done to, to them, and it's the cost of, of our society having a judicial system not address these, these problems. So I'm hoping that we will basically reduce the cost to the individual, to society, and to our taxpayers. One of the, uh, another of your priorities that you have stated is you want to look into ways to make the New York's courts more user-friendly. Are you suggesting that they're not user-friendly now? Um, what are we talking about? Courts are definitely user-friendly. Um, it's the it's not that every court suffers. It's that some courts have cried out for certain uh, reviews. And most notably, I heard when I went around the state this past year, people talking about <coughs> how the family courts could be a lot more user-friendly to families and to lawyers who have to meet in the courthouse. Um, whether it's something as simple as having a nice, quiet place to talk, uh, the ability to uh, receive emails, the ability to download information, perhaps get a, a decision from the courthouse, uh, an, a nice place to have a cup of coffee. Uh, it's also true for the members of the judiciary. Uh, some of the infrastructure really does deserve a, a look-see uh, by a committee of committed people who can see whether it really meets the, the needs of today's society. And after all, when you walk into a courthouse, you want to feel good about being there, not threatened, not as if you can't find a bathroom, not that the bathroom has the proper signage, but the ba very basics of good administration of justice and I'm hopeful that we're going to do a survey that looks at all the courthouses and that sees the good ones and the ones that could use a little work. I know and the family courts have been, um, people have been talking about the family courts as uh, being problematical for some time. And of course, those are places where a lot of very emotional issues 
get played out, you know, and, uh, you know, when, when they're crowded and when you've got the person that you've got an order of, of protection against who's sitting right across from you in the, in the hallway, that, that's, that's, that's a problem. So well, I know the family. I remember going to law school, and one of the things I did in my last year was to help battered spouses uh, down in family court. And I do remember what those conditions look like. Now, we have a beautiful new family court in Manhattan, um, which has none of the issues that we're talking about. But there are other places where I'm sure we, there's room for improvement. Right. Now, you talked about improving the situation of the judiciary, not, and, but not just in court, but, you know, there's been this issue of judicial salaries. That's been an issue for a long time. Yes. Um, are judges underpaid? And if they are, why can't they get a salary increase? You know, this has been an issue that's plagued us for the last nine years, nine plus years, and it's not just a state issue, it's also a federal issue. Uh, under our Constitution, the right to uh, salary increase is tied to the legislature. We're one of the states that uh, requires the legislature to approve of judicial salary increases. Why hasn't it been approved? Because in the past, every time the legislature goes to increase the judicial pay, uh, they also increase their own pay. Uh, and that lockstep uh, juncture of the two uh, leads to a situation where uh, unless there's money for them, they're not going to approve money for the judges. You know, our judges are really hardworking people. And What's uh, the average salary, our starting salary for the a The average starting salary for a Supreme Court judge is $136,000. And has that remained, have those salaries remained absolutely flat for 10 years? They have. They, there's no cost of living increase, nothing? No. Just flat. No. In the federal courts, there's been some minor cost of living adjustments, but in state court, it has remained flat for nine years. Mm -hmm. So it's a dramatically bad situation for our judges, and therefore the chief judge of the state, as you know, filed a lawsuit earlier this year, and uh, the Supreme Court just issued a decision, Judge Lehner, um, finding it unconstitutional uh, to tie the, uh, the judges' salaries to the legislative salaries under a separation of powers theory. Have the, has the legislature not gotten an increase, a raise in nine years? Uh, that's right. Really? Right. Wow. All right. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with more with Bernice Lieber, president of the New York State Bar Association, after this message. I helped build it. India made me my house and my family made it. We are also Yeah, is this from our Pakistan? We are also coming to our land. We are saving up for our children. Habitat's building homes all over the world. Come join us and help build it. Habitat for Humanity. Donate. Volunteer. Get involved. Visit Habitat.org. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Bernice Lieber, president of the New York State Bar Association. Crime has been dropping in the city for years, maybe two decades, uh, certainly, certainly at least one decade. Does that mean that business for lawyers is down? <laughs> no, actually, uh, I don't think so. I think that the uh, business community uh, and the thriving New York economy has actually assisted uh, New York law firms, uh, and uh, we've fared pretty well. Uh, the most recent crisis, though, has been the downturn in the housing, secondary housing market, and that's had devastating effects for people all across the state uh, and for lawyers, and it's a it's sort of a critical year for all of us in the state. Mm -hmm. um, How's that affecting lawyers? Well, necessarily, uh, you know, there's fewer house closings, uh, fewer developments, uh, the or is there's less money in the financial markets for for that kind of thing, and uh, it necessarily has a trickle effect on lawyers as mm -hmm. well, as part of this economy. Right. How about the issue of um, legal fees for attorneys who are assigned to represent either you know and you know indigent clients or who are mandated lawyers for some other reason. Well, you know, uh, recently, uh, I would say in the last three years, the New York County Lawyers Association brought a lawsuit 
uh, because those those uh, legal fees had remained stagnant. Uh, lawyers were earning uh, uh, fifty dollars an hour for for doing. Uh, the population's most vulnerable citizens, 18B work, uh, and they successfully challenged those rates and uh, raised them to $75 an hour. Uh, and while it's not terrific, it's better than it had been. Right. Um, the other whole pos problem is the, is the whole issue of funding for civil legal services that you're raising. And our state bar has been on the forefront of trying to increase uh, th those funding levels and create permanent legal funding. Uh, back in the uh, last year of the Spitzer administration, uh, the governor uh, advocated for $15.8 million, which is the highest level of civil legal service funding by the state to date. Um, but with the downturn in the economy uh, this year, uh, he retracted it down to a million dollars. And so the state bar went to bat and uh, encouraged the governor to raise those levels of funding. Um, it was hoped for a period of time that uh, attorneys' IOLA accounts, which is the interest on lawyers' accounts, um, would receive most favored customer ratings from the banks. That's one of the things that Governor Spitzer had accomplished. And uh, But with the downturn in the economy, the interest rates have been falling. Right. And so there's a gap. And right now, uh, while we moved the funding back up to about seven and a half million dollars, um, that's still half the levels of what it was last year. And so you're looking at a vulnerable population with housing problems and, and uh, family law problems, and they're, they're, they're going to be hit by this loss of funding. And that's for civil legal representation. That's apart from legal aid? Yes, that's apart from legal aid. How's legal aid doing? Well, you know, there are only three funding sources in the state. One is the Legal Services Corporation, one is the IOLA accounts, and one is whatever the legislature gives us. We're all going to be impacted by this um, because uh, the, the lesser, the less money you have, the less attorneys you can have working on cases. And they all depend upon those three funding sources to keep going. There have been a lot of stories in the news, you know, at least one every week about lawyers who have engaged in some kind of nefarious illegal activity, usually um, misusing or stealing clients' money, paying bribes to judges to get favorable rulings, working in concert with judges to get lucrative cases assigned to them. There's a front page story in the Times about a law firm. I didn't get a chance to read it entirely, but I think it was a law firm that w perhaps involved in shredding the documents for, you know, the, in the Enron uh, situation. Does the association play any role in regulating or advising um, these attorneys, and do you defend lawyers who uh, are accused of bad behavior? Well, the New York State Bar Association uh, proudly established uh, something called the Client Protection Fund in about 1982. It just celebrated its 25th anniversary uh, because the profession felt that the few lawyers who do harm, and it's really are the few that you're talking about here, Cheryl, um, really should there should be an outlet for providing compensation to the clients who have been victimized by those few counsel. Um, the State Bar Association has actually created the whole mechanism through the legislature for this, and since in the last 25 years, there have been over $280 million awarded to people who have been injured. Um, we don't regulate lawyers. That The regulation of lawyers is done through the court system under the grievance committees all around the state and the four appellate divisions. Um, what the State Bar does is we ensure that uh, there is a, a way to compensate victims. Uh, we issue ethics opinions. Uh, we also help write and assist the court in writing the ethical code, which we did just finished this year. Uh, and we try to give guidance to lawyers to prevent them from happening. And thankfully, very few of these cases exist. In fact, the case that you mentioned really um, was, a, I would say, a, an unusual situation involving the Milberg firm, um, which was uh, where the uh, principals had uh, uh, approached clients and had them um, on, on retainer, if you will, to bring these cl securities class actions. But even as the U.S. attorney admits there, those are very highly irregular cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you pleased with the way the disciplinary system for lawyers works in the state? Generally, I think the disciplinary committees do a terrific job at ferreting out the problems. Uh, 
And I think that we've done a, a very credible job. I think they've done a very credible job at bringing people um, to justice and hearing clients' complaints. Could it be better? Of course it could be better. And there are various ways to make it better, um, including, for instance, having a, a database that is shared among the disciplinary council, um, which is something that I'm advocating for this year. You know, it seems that every few years we see some survey um, that's reporting to tell us which uh, members of which professions are the least happy, <laughs> whether it's um, the cops or school teachers or people in academia or whether they are, are, are lawyers. How happy are lawyers with their work these days? Do you get a sense of that? Well, you know, in, in talking to people around the state, I get the sense that lawyers are very, very happy in their profession because it's so intellectually challenging and because helping people is really what the profession is all about. But I will tell you that... Um, it's not because they're drinking a lot after work, is it? Well, <laughs> since you're raising that, the, the legal profession, unfortunately, has lawyers in need, and we are have the highest depression levels of most really jobs in the country. We're at the... We're at the top of the list, um, and the state bar has therefore started a lawyer's assistance program around the state, which working with county bar associations actually has hotlines and help and assistance for lawyers who suffer from depression. Why do you think that is? It's a very stressful profession. You know, if you're helping uh, some people get divorced, if you're helping uh, keep a child with its parent, his, his or her parent, if you're helping in a business crisis, People who are lawyers have to step in and and very calmly try and deal with what is otherwise a a crisis situation. And I think that most of us carry it home with us. Uh, we wouldn't be human if we didn't. Mm -hmm. You've heard the lawyer jokes. Are lawyers getting a bum rap? Do you think? I think lawyers generally get some lawyers get a bum bum rap. Yeah, I think that. Um, People should understand that lawyers really do try and help society, that uh, we are have always been in the forefront of all that we think is good in society, when, if, whether you take the uh, civil rights movement in the 60s or you take people who advocated for expanding um, equal rights in marriage. Um, lawyers have always been on the forefront of making positive reform in this society, and I hope that um, at the end of this year we can see some of that in some of these initiatives that I'm starting. You know, following up on that, and you talk about you know lawyers as leaders, advocates for social change and reform. The Bush administration has been criticized for using politics to tread on a lot of people's legal and constitutional rights, whether we're talking about domestic wiretapping or denial of access uh, to the federal courts to detainees at Guantanamo Bay. And there was a recent Supreme Court ruling saying that they have the right to challenge their detention in the federal courts. Has the association gotten involved in an activist role in, in challenging any of these policies? We have. Last year, we brought a resolution before our House in which the House uh, considered the question of Guantanamo detainees and brought it to the forefront of the ABA as well. And we currently have a report that we're pe that's pending that was, we're going to look at this Saturday that describes the very Supreme Court case that you mentioned, Cheryl, and that advocates for Congress to pass constitutional laws so that people, now that the United States Supreme Court has issued its ruling, are, are guaranteed the fundamental rights that are consistent with our Constitution. And the State Bar has, I'm proud to say, had a very long and cherished history in that regard. Um, and we will continue to advocate for that because, you know, there are a lot of open issues after that that ruling, right. including the one about whether there should be stays issued pending trials that are supposed to go ahead in September um, dealing with the Guantanamo Bay uh, prisoners. And there was a previous uh, act of Congress that's saying, well, you know, they have to have some kind of um, legal redress, but not in the federal courts. You know, the military right. tribunals are fine. Right. You know. And looking closer to home, I mean, it also affects us as lawyers because there's been an erosion of the attorney-client privilege uh, under the current administration that we're, we're, we're deliberately trying to avoid. 
So uh, we're very cognizant of that and of the privacy rights of our clients and people and lawyers. I don't know to what extent the association gets involved in politics, you know, if it, if it does or at least in campaigns, you know, politicking, if at all. Um, do you have any particular concerns about, well, I'm sure, you, as, as president of the association, about the future direction of the country under either of the two candidates running for president? You know, we're a 501c6 organization. We do have a Bar Foundation, which is a charitable organization, the charitable arm. Uh, we don't go out in politic per se, because that we don't have a PAC or any of right. those kinds of things. But uh, I've decided that it is an important agenda item this year. It's an election year. It's a special year. And so I've invited the 50 state bar presidents here in New York during the ABA convention in August to meet and develop sort of a roadmap of the top initiatives that the states from a state bar perspective believe the presidential candidates should be focusing on. Because back in 1961, President Kennedy held a meeting among all the state bar presidents. And what gave rise from that meeting was the civil rights organizations, the Lawyers for Civil Rights, which to this day is a, a very distinguished organization that preserves people's civil rights. The Lawyers Committee rights. for, for Civil Rights. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that as a result of this meeting, having all of the 50 state bar presidents come and meet in New York at my offices, we'll be able to present that kind of agenda of what our thoughts are to the presidents. To both candidates. of the candidates. Yes. We're out of time. But wow. I want to thank Bernice Lieber, president of the New York State Bar Association, for joining me. And for the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.